Well, good evening. Welcome to our service this evening as we come to praise and worship uh, God. Uh, you'll notice in just a moment uh, that we have loaned a presenter from uh, the tail end of the congregation. But I think it's just uh, really encouraging and a re-emphasis that we are one congregation, uh, that we are uh, together here serving Jesus from the town and the villages. Uh, wonderful for Hector and Winnie to be with us and Hector to lead us in the praise of God uh, this evening as our usual presenters are either unwell or away at the moment. And so we do continue to remember those who are away at camps, especially the camps that have taken place and the ones that are ongoing and still to go. Uh, so continue to remember uh, our own Rod and Emma and Kenny Hugh as they're down in Oswestry uh, and some of Alistair's own children who, are, who have been and who are at Oswestry and some of our own girls here who are just back from there this past, this past week. So let us worship God together, let's sing, and we're going to sing in Psalm 139, uh, Psalm 139a in the Sing Psalms, it's on page 180, and we're going to sing the first 10 verses. O Lord, you have examined me, you know me through and through, my sitting, rising, all my thoughts afar are known to you. Psalm 139 a, from verse 1 to 10, we'll stand and sing to God's praise. Pray to God. Lord our God, as we come this evening into your house and now collectively into prayer, we bow our heads as an expression of our hearts bowing down to you. Uh, we want to be 
humble in your presence. As we were even hearing this morning, we are to come humbly and honestly uh, to the Lord our God. And so we seek to do that for the first time as we seek our sins to be forgiven. And we do that every time, every day, as your children, we come humbly and honestly to you, our God. The psalm that we've been singing, it tells us of your far-reaching knowledge about everything and especially about us. The psalmist is questioning, where can I go from you where you won't see me? Where can I run that you will not know in the place that I have gone? And the answer is nowhere. The answer is that you, O God, know all things about us. You know where we are and what we're doing. You know and you see our outside and you know us on the inside. You know our hearts. And for all of us, that is a humbling fact that you truly know our hearts. For we can, uh, we can portray an image of ourselves to our friends, uh, to our congregation, to, uh, to this community. And where that may be genuine and heartfelt, yet we know truly that sin has such a hold of each one of us. And it strangles even the good that we want to do. The sin that is in our hearts, it diverts us from the track that we want to be on. We want to be serving you and living our lives for you. The sin that is in our hearts, it, it damages and it breaks relationships in our families and with our friends. The sin that is in our hearts, it plunges us down into the depths of this world, into the ditches that are found in this world, and where we try to run away from God, where we try to hide from you, where we twist what God says. But what we see in the Bible is that you know all things about us. And so there's no point putting on any kind of mask when we come to pray, when we come to worship. But we come as, again, we heard, even from that hymn, surely what that thief on the cross could have sung, nothing in my hands I bring, simply to the cross I cling. And so, Lord, we come again, we hope and pray, we come empty-handed. And we thank you for the grace of God, for the gospel of Jesus Christ, that we can be filled uh, this evening. We can be filled with your love, love that we didn't expect to receive, that we can be tonight forgiven and reminded that we are forgiven from all of our sin, past, present, and future. We struggle to let ourselves off the hook, never mind what others may say about us. We struggle to forgive ourselves, and yet we shouldn't, because you, our Heavenly Father, who knows all things about us, has forgiven all sin. You have forgiven all of our sin, the fact that we are sinners. And so, Lord, help us as we study your word this evening. It'll be humbling, but we pray that it'll be rewarding, as it always is, to be in your word. Rewarding because we learn about what a loving God uh, we have. Father, we continue praying then uh, for the camps that have been going on over the past uh, few weeks and will continue for the next few weeks. We thank you for them. We are so thankful that uh, the young folk have been able to return in this way to be with friends that they've not seen perhaps or new friends that they've made for the leaders that were able to assemble and be there and enjoy it themselves, but to come uh, seeking to share the gospel with those uh, campers. Now, we thank you for our own girls here in, in Hilton who have just been on this westry, for some of the girls in Tain who have been at Kincraig, 
uh, for the, our own leaders who are down in us yesterday, for Rod and Emma and Kenny Hugh. Uh, and Lord, we just thank you for the football camp that I was at a few weeks ago as well. Lord, we just pray for these camps. We pray that they will be blessed. And as over 250 young people gather around the nation of the United Kingdom through these free church camps, and 100 leaders, that there would be a blessing, that there would, you would pour out your blessing. That it would not just be for these seven days that they are together, but as they return even to our own congregations, that's where there's not the same uh, camaraderie, there's not 40 other young people or intense Bible study from leaders day after day, but there is the same God who is at Oswestry or Ken Craig or Renfrew. The same God is here in Hilton and in Tame. The God that was so amazing about these camps. The God they were learning about and singing about and seeing reflected in the leaders and other campers' lives. That same God is here and is the one whom we worship tonight. And so we pray that as the young folk return even to our own church, that we would continue to show them that love of Jesus. And indeed, they would show that love that they have in their hearts to us as a congregation too. We pray for specific congregations uh, as we get these prayer points uh, week by week. We pray for Fortro's Free Church. Uh, we were thinking, uh, we were hearing just a few weeks ago from Rory Stott, the minister, as he, as he preached at our communion. Uh, we pray for him and his wife, Christine, and their daughter, Faith. Uh, we thank you for them, for their ministry to us, uh, but we pray for them in their own congregation Uh, We pray with them for two new families to join the congregation, if that be your will, and for the launch of their new church website in the coming weeks. Lord, we pray for them there as they seek to reach out with the gospel, as we do here collectively in the highlands of Scotland. And we do pray, seeking your mercy and your blessing. So be with us this evening. Forgive us for our sin. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. We will continue singing this psalm, Psalm 139a in the Sing Psalms. Uh, We pick up the the singing from verse 11 down to verse 16. And it continues the theme of God knowing everything about us and now God seeing us at all times. So verse 11, page 180. If I should say, surely the dark will hide me from your sight. When all the light surrounding me becomes as dark as night, yet even darkness is not dark to you in any way, for darkness is as light to you, the night will shine like day. Psalm 139a from verse 11 to God's praise. If I should say to
Let's turn in our Bibles to the Old Testament and to uh, the second book of Samuel and chapter 11. Second Samuel and chapter 11. It's on page 314. A familiar story within uh, the Old Testament. Uh, not one I relish to preach, and yet the Lord leads us uh, in this way. 2 Samuel 11, let's hear uh, the Word of God. In the spring at the time when kings go off to war, David sent Joab out with the king's men and the whole Israelite army. They destroyed the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained in Jerusalem. One evening, David got up from his bed and walked around on the roof of the palace. From the roof, he saw a woman bathing. The woman was very beautiful, and David sent someone to find out about her. The man said, isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite? Then David sent messengers to get her. She came to him, and he slept with her. She had purified herself from her uncleanness. Then she went back home. The woman conceived and sent word to David, saying, I am pregnant. So David sent this word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent him to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked him how Joab was, how the soldiers were, and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. So Uriah left the palace, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the entrance to the palace with all his master's servants, and did not go down to his house. When David was told Uriah did not go home, he asked him, Haven't you just come from a distance? Why didn't you go home? Uriah said to David, The ark and Israel and Judah are, are staying in tents, and my master Joab and my lord's men are camped in the open fields. How could I go to my house to eat and drink and lie with my wife? As surely as you live, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to him, Stay here one more day, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day and the next. At David's invitation, he ate and drank with him, and David made him drunk. But in the evening, Uriah went out to sleep on his mat among his master's servants. He did not go home. In the morning, David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it with Uriah. In it, he wrote, Put Uriah in the front line where the fighting is fiercest. Then withdraw from him so that he will be struck down and die. So while Joab had the city under siege, he put Uriah at a place where he knew the strongest defenders were. When the men of the city came out and fought against Joab, some of the men in David's army fell. Moreover, Uriah the Hittite died. Joab sent David a full account of the battle. He instructed the messenger, When you have finished giving the king this account of the battle, the king's anger may flare up, and he may ask you, Why did you get so close to the city to fight? Didn't you know they would shoot arrows from the wall? Who killed Abimelech, son of Jerubbesheth? Didn't a woman throw an upper millstone on him from the wall so that he died in Thebes? Why did you get so close to the wall? If he asks you this, then say to him, Also your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. The messenger set out, and when he arrived, he told David everything Joab had sent him to say. The messenger sent to David, the men overpowered us and came out against us in the open, but we drove them back to the entrance of the city gate. Then the archers shot arrows at your servants from the wall, and some of the king's men died. Moreover, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead. 
David told the messenger, Say this to Joab, Don't let this upset you. The sword devours one as well as another. Press the attack against the city and destroy it. Say this to encourage Joab. When Uriah's wife heard that her husband was dead, she mourned for him. After the time of mourning was over, David had her brought to the house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Amen. This is the word of God. Well, before we sing this passage, let's study this passage, let's sing again one of David's psalms that fully or to a large extent display the sin that he has committed in Psalm 51 in the Scottish Psalter. Psalm 51, page 281. Or beginning on 280. Psalm, a confession of David's sin, and yet recognizing that with the Lord there is forgiveness. Psalm 51, David sings, After thy loving kindness, Lord, have mercy upon me. For thy compassions great blot out all mine iniquity. Psalm 51, from verse, from verse 1 to God's praise.
As you have your Bible open again to 2 Samuel 11, and as you think back over the story we've just read in this chapter, we think about the sin that David has committed, the cover-up that he tried to do. Let me just read the bottom line of the chapter, the end of verse 27. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. The story between David and Bathsheba could very easily be played out on Netflix or on TV because what we find on these channels is that this story is gripping and it's full of drama, intensity, lies, adultery, a cover-up, and a murder. Each episode and scene would have viewers gripping onto the edge of their seats. And yet the story that we find here in 2 Samuel 11 is not there for our entertainment, but is there for our warning. A few weeks ago in my own quiet time, I was reading this chapter as I read through 2 Samuel And the Lord highlighted to me the bottom line of this chapter. But the thing David had done displeased the Lord. Or literally, the thing David had done was evil in the eyes of the Lord. And you may think, well, obviously... It was evil in the eyes of the Lord. It was hardly going to fill the Lord with joy, was it? But dig a little deeper than that. Think a little more about it. Meditate on that last line, the bottom line. Because I thought, and then I checked to make sure, but it was right. That is the only mention of the Lord that there is through the whole of this chapter. As this episode of scandal plays out, God is not cited. I was surprised at first, but then I thought, well, of course he isn't. God would have nothing to do with this rotten ring of sin. God does not make us sin. He is never part of our sin, and he will never condone our sin. Sin lies to us. And then we begin to think, well, it won't happen to me. Or I won't be seen. Or nobody will ever know. So I want to explore these three aspects that I believe we see in this chapter, launching from the end, if you like, from the bottom line, Everything that plays out in this chapter. So not me, not seen, and not known. David would have thought, it wouldn't happen to me, or at least I wouldn't be seen, or nobody is going to know. So let's look at each of these uh, in turn. First of all, not me. Because who would end up in a situation like this, 2 Samuel 11 pushing God not only to the fringes, but out of our lives. We would maybe suggest that it's a danger for the young or for the spiritually immature or for those who are inconsistent in their attendance to church. Yes, them too, but also you. I preached a sermon on backsliding not so long ago. I don't intend to retrace all those steps. But none of us are immune to this danger. We all know our hearts, let alone looking at anybody else. This chapter is the record of David's fall. King David. Who would have thought it? Probably not David. After all, this is the boy chosen by the Lord. This is the young man who fought and defeated the giant Goliath. 
This is the shepherd boy who rescued lambs from the mouths of lions and bears. This was David, King David, the man after God's own heart. And he not only falls, but he plunges into leadership and moral failure. There are few other characters in the Bible whose sin is laid so bare for us all to see than King David. The bottom line is that David is a warning to us all how suddenly any of us can be susceptible to the traps of the devil. A large part of the Old Testament is the unfolding story of the people wanting a king, wanting a leader to guide them to political and to social victory. If only they could find somebody who was equal to the task. Saul wasn't, Solomon wouldn't be, and clearly we see David isn't. And our world still does this. We still do this. In some ways, we want to give us a leader who can steer this country. If Netflix are, are looking for drama, then 10 Downing Street provides plenty. There's another shortlist drawn as to who will fill the vacancy of prime minister. However, he or she will no sooner have their feet under the table when there will be cries for them to be ousted and removed from their position. You see, the problem with David and Saul and Samuel, Boris Johnson, Prince William, is that they're all sinners. We need someone who is not a sinner. Actually, more than that, we need someone who can take away our sin. You know, the well-known hymn, uh, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing, It has a line in it that as Christians should sober us this evening. We are prone to wonder. Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. And you must ask the question, how does that happen? Because when you became a Christian, You loved the Lord. You were singing your heart out. You were attending all the services. And yet, we've all, if we've been a Christian for any length of time, know that this hymn writer is correct. We are prone to wonder and prone to leave the God we love. Now, the author of that hymn is a man called uh, Robert Robinson. And he was converted under the preaching of George Whitfield in 1752. He became a, a Baptist minister in Cambridge. But towards the end of his life, he let his guard down and he backslid in his own faith. And there was one day he was on a bus and there was this total stranger. And that total stranger was looking over some hymns. And yes, you know the story's going. This stranger was persistently referring to his hymn, Come Thy Fount of Every Blessing. And as she kept on speaking, Robinson became so agitated that he burst out and he said to her, Madam, I am the poor, unhappy man who composed that hymn many years ago. And I would give a thousand worlds if I had them to enjoy the feelings I had then. We must be so careful as Christians. We cannot use excuses, but all my sins are forgiven anyway. Oh, but this would never happen to me. You know, if we think like that, then we have in fact already taken a step in our decline. The only safe ground is to pray with Robinson, O to grace, how great a debtor 
daily I'm constrained to be. Let that grace grow like a fetter. Bind my wandering heart to thee. It won't be me, not me. It could be. So we must be on guard. So not me, but secondly, not sin. Well, maybe I can do it because I won't be seen. I can commit this sin because nobody will see me. Now, when we attempt to sideline God, when we try to uh, live our lives as if he was not part of our lives, the danger we end up in is frightening. And we begin to think, nobody can see me doing this or going there, so what harm will it really do? Uh, this narrative uh, of the, the narrative of the preceding chapter is really telling because chapter 10 is centered around this war with the Ammonites. But chapter 11 turns from the front lines into the royal bedroom. One commentator said that there is nothing in this chapter but action. There is no conversation. There is no hint of caring, of affection, of love, only lust. David's sin didn't begin with Bathsheba. His sin began when he didn't go off to the battle. Verse 1, in the spring, at the time when the kings go off to war, David stayed at home. All the fighting men were away. Nobody was around to see him. He was free from the eyes of the locals, but he was not free from the eyes of God. During uh, lockdown, there was this challenge going around on social media where parents were testing their children to see how patient they could be and how obedient they would be to following instructions. Uh, unbeknown to the children, the parent had set up their phone camera somewhere in the room and then placed a big bowl of sweets, for example, in front of the child. What was the catch? Well, the child was told not to touch them until their parent goes out of the room and returns. The test is, will the child be obedient? Will they refrain from giving in to the temptation when it seems like nobody was watching? More often than not, as the parent steps out of the room, the child, thinking nobody is watching, grabs the sweets and tries to swallow it before their parent returns. And what danger we are in if we think we can get off with a certain act because we think nobody is watching. Now, the secret sins of your life, and the secret sins of your hearts, that perhaps never even see the light of day, they may only occur in your mind. They can cause great harm to yourself and to the people around you. You know, the truth about David, it's not because he was the king that he thought, I can get off with this sin. It's not only because there were less people about, so he thought there was less people to see him. It's not even because he was a man that he thought he could get off with it. It was because he was a sinner. His lust, his gratification, his desire consumed him, and nothing was going to stop him. And as a sinner, we are in that danger too. For David, seeing Bathsheba bathing outside her home wasn't a sin, but keeping his eyes on her was. We're told we have about three seconds in that situations like that to decide, am I going to keep looking, or am I going to look away. And whatever it is that you are tempted to covet or to lust after, it doesn't have to be a person, it can be an object or a holiday or a relationship, we must learn to let our eyes bounce off those images so they do not lead us to sin. 
And you know, you can think to these moments of temptation in your past and realize that there is no coincidence that when you are tempted to sin, you heard that voice or the opportunity presented itself to stop. In that moment, you had a choice to listen to God's voice or to ignore him. The bottom line is, God is always watching. Proverbs 15, 3, the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, keeping watch on the wicked and the good. There is no place or time or occasion when God's eyes are shifted from you. And you know, that fact that God's eyes are always on you, it's not designed to scare you or even just as a deterrent to our sinful behavior. God's seeing and watching over you is a precious privilege. Our Father cares for you. He wants to protect you and lead you and guide you away from Satan's snares. So not me, not seen, and thirdly, not known. Uh, there's an artist, Peter Bruegel, and he had a painting of the crucifixion. You may know it, you may not. He had a painting of the crucifixion stolen from a church in Italy just three years ago. And it was such a prized possession because it was worth an estimated 3.4 million pounds. Uh, thieves used the hammer to smash open the display case and they made off with it in a car. Get in, get out. That was their desire, that was their design, and that was their plan. How would anyone know? Nobody will know, they thought. How would anybody find out? Well, the local police received a tip-off just hours before the theft, and they replaced the genuine painting with a fake. They installed cameras all over the church building to know exactly who these criminals were. As the thieves went in to steal the painting, they didn't know that they were being watched the whole time. In their attempt to steal something precious, they left with something worthless. And sin always does that to you. You think you're going to get something precious and yet it leaves you or you get something worthless. David's sin uh, it didn't end with this lustful look. It didn't even end by committing adultery. His lies spiraled out of control and we, as we read through this chapter, when David slept with this woman, he thought, nobody's going to know. How would they know? The writer of this chapter, there's so many, even as I was reading it again there, there's so many literary features in 2 Samuel 11. But he, the writer deliberately shines a spotlight almost exclusively on David throughout this chapter. There was two people that sinned that day, right? There was two people. But Bathsheba, she only has three words in English, only two words in Hebrew. She says, I am pregnant. And with these words commenced the cover-up by David so that nobody would know. And so he had three strategies. Strategy one, or three plans Strategy one, he sends for Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, to come back from the battle, go home to his wife, and then nobody will ever know that the un unborn child belongs to David. But Uriah, out of respect for his fellow soldiers, he refused to go home and be with his wife. So strategy two, David tries again, but this time he makes Uriah drunk, sends him home to be with his wife, Again, though, he refuses and sleeps outside with, his, with the servants. And what you're meant to see as you read this unfolding narrative, what you're meant to see is the respectable, admirable character of Uriah in total contrast to the man after God's own heart, King David. 
Well, final plan, strategy three. As a last resort, David sends Uriah back to the battle and gives him a letter to carry to Joab. And that letter was, in essence, Uriah's death sentence. He was placed on the front line and he was killed by the enemy. You see, for one, you see, for David, he wanted Uriah out of the picture. And the one sin he committed led to another sin and then to another. Who's going to know about it? God knows all about it. You know, as you read your Bible, you cannot help but be made aware of the overwhelming fact that God knows. God knows. He knows you far better than you know yourself. In Numbers 32, 23, be sure your sins will find you out. In the psalm we were singing, Psalm 139, in verse 3, he knows my going out and my lying down. All my ways are known to you. In Galatians 6, 7, God shall not be mocked. We cannot pull the wool over his eyes. He sees us. And he knows us. The bottom line is, none of us are immune from plummeting to the depths like King David did. The bottom line is that we are all guilty sinners. We have all let the Lord down. We have all tried to run from him. We have all tried to cover and hide our sin from him. We must own up to him. And confess our sin to him. It's not a matter of trying harder to be good. Or being a better Christian. Or not doing that sin anymore. Because you've worked it out. The more we, when we try really not to do that anymore. Just in and of ourselves. We always end up doing it again. It's about resting in the finished work of Jesus. It's about seeking his help to overcome. Hear this life-giving, sin-cleansing word to us who are sinners, who must come empty-handed, whether we're able to answer all the theological questions that they dreamt of as you enter into heaven, or whether we come like that thief on the cross, the man in the middle cross said I could come. He said he could come because like David sings in Psalm 130, if you, O Lord, kept track of my sins, then who could stand? It's the answer to that question. Who could stand if the Lord counts your sins? Nobody. But hallelujah, he keeps on singing. But with you, the Lord, there is forgiveness. There is forgiveness. God knows you. And he knows everything about you. All of your sin. Public and private. But you must know this about God. He is willing to forgive all of your sin. Knowing God is not simply knowing who he is. It is knowing what he has done and believing he has done it for you. We have no excuse to keep on sinning, but we have every reason to keep on running to Jesus. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, and we are humbled by your word because we know our own hearts. Uh, we don't have to look at anybody else. We don't have to think about anybody else. Uh, we know the sin that is attached to us. And yet, 
if we know you are God, if we know what Jesus has done, if we believe that he has done it for me, then we can sing in conclusion this evening with joy in our hearts because we are forgiven. And let us go out of this place this evening rejoicing, having been reminded again by you, our God, that we are forgiven. All of our sin is forgiven. We are cleansed. We have been washed and we will be accepted into glory. And because of what I've done, not because of what I know, but because of the man in the middle cross, Jesus Christ. Because he died for my sins. Do we believe that? We, Lord, we pray tonight that everybody hearing your word, you speaking, would know their sins to be forgiven. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's sing these words of forgiveness in Psalm 130 in the Scottish Psalter. It's on page 421. Lord, from the depths to thee I cried, my voice, Lord, do thou hear Unto my supplications voice give an attentive ear. Lord, who shall stand if thou, O Lord, shouldst mark iniquity? But yet with thee forgiveness is that feared thou mayest be. Psalm 130, to God's praise. May grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit rest and abide with each one of you, both now and forevermore. Amen.